This episode of the Modern Therapist Survival Guide is brought to you by Lisa Marie Counting. Numbers, finances, budgeting. Do you cringe just thinking about your business numbers? Are they your absolute nemesis? If you don't know what's coming in or what's going out, or what's available for marketing or what's owed for taxes, chaos ensues. Panic, fear, and even shame take over. At Lisa Marie Accounting, she knows that an owner who understands her finances takes control over her business and her destiny. Lisa's job is to help you get your numbers feeling sassy, sexy, and a whole lot badassy. Because when you know and love your numbers, everything you do is informed, calculated, and creates unbridled success. Listen at the end of the episode for more from Lisa Marie Accounting. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Whithelm with Katie Vernoy, and we had an episode out towards the end of last year about therapist suicides that we got a tremendous amount of response from our community. We are going to do a two-part episode going more into depth on suicidality. One is one that we had kind of already in the works as far as handling our work around client suicidality, but some of the questions that we had, which will come in our part two episode, dealing with therapist suicidality, and we'll get into more details on that in the other episode. But this is a topic that comes up a lot in therapy. It's one that many therapists get a a smattering of suggestions about how to work with. Some of those suggestions are good, some are not, some are outdated. And we've reached out to a colleague and one of our modern therapist community members, Noreen Vanderhoeven. She's an LCSW in Westlake Village, California, and a phenomenal resource on suicide. And thank you so much for joining us and sharing your wisdom with us today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. We're so excited to have you here. Maybe excited is the wrong word. We're so (laughs) pleased that you're here. The topic is not one that is necessarily exciting. It's required and it's necessary, but I will have my own responses to this topic in a moment. The way that we start these episodes is who are you and what are you putting out in the world? I'm Noreen Vanderhoeven. I am a licensed clinical social worker in Westlake Village, California. I've been in practice for over 30 years, and most of my time in the social work field has been with nonprofits, working with always kids at risk. It's been mostly kids and teens, although since I've been in private practice, it's kind of shifted to mostly adults. I supervised a mobile crisis response team for Ventura County for five years, and that was 24-7, where it was up to age 17 through age 17, where anybody could call to talk about if they had at risk, if someone was at risk, if the youth themselves called they were at risk, we can go anywhere within the county to provide the assessment. And we had privileges to place them on a 72 hour hold. So it was there that that's when I started getting more into this. And Really kind of what I put out into the world is a lot of, I always talk a lot with my clients and with everybody really about just abundance and gratitude. And some people are just, you know, they have just a, such, such a tough time and they really struggle to get that gratitude piece. And I find that that really has a big shift with a lot of people when you're able to kind of work with them on that. I imagine for a lot of people who enter into working with suicide, suicideology, if that's the the right term in in studying suicides, glad that I'm not just making up words (laughs) here, but imagine that there's, there's kind of two people, two kinds of people who enter into this, those who have been personally affected by somebody in their life who has either attempted or died from suicide, or people who are in positions where by necessity they are learning a lot about suicide because of the clients that they're working with. And it sounds like you're at least fully one foot into that second camp right there. But as you've seen across (laughs) your career, how are clinicians changing in their approach to 
working with suicide, what's kind of shifted as far as best practices around this goes? So it's interesting that you say that because when I first started on the crisis team, I had no idea that it had anything to do with suicide. They're like, oh, it's a crisis team. I'm like, okay, I've worked in crisis (laughs) all my career. I can do this. Yeah. (laughs) And um, then all of a sudden I take the job and then I find out what it really is. I'm like, oh, (laughs) that's how I really started getting more information and knowledge and specializing in it. And that's when I got involved with American Association of Suicidology. And within six months of my being in that position, their conference happened to be in Los Angeles. So I told my boss, we got to go to this. And thinking like I knew a lot already in six months, I went and I knew nothing. Wow. (laughs) And it was just amazing. This is a whole nother world that opened up to me. And so I've gotten more and more involved in that. And within that, I've kind of seen that people, number one, either are afraid to ask about you know, suicide, or they don't know how to ask about suicide. A lot of people associate like they think self harm is suicide, and it's not. And so what I have really tried to do is I developed this online six module course, because now California is going to be requiring six CEs in 2021. And that really kind of goes through the whole step from when it's a crisis, all the way through to the end. And that's so key, because Part of it is, is if you do a really good solid intake, asking all the questions that you need to ask, then you'll be prepared when your client does say that they're suicidal. Because I, a lot of clinicians that I've talked to, even when I was on the crisis line, clinicians would call and we would say, and they would say, oh, I have my client is suicidal. Okay, well, have you asked them? And they'll go, no, I can't ask them that. Huh. You have to ask them. And you would be shocked at how many people this is. And it continues into today that I have therapists call me to consult. And they're still, you know, like hesitant to ask sometimes, or if I, you know, kind of give them a direction to go that sounds like a little more risky for them. They're just so hesitant. They're like, Oh, my God, I'm going to lose my relationship with them. If I do something, you know, I mean, if someone's really suicidal, you have to take action. And some therapists are just afraid to do that. So I'm really trying to detail all the steps as how to do that so you can best serve your clients and then you don't wind up in this, oh my gosh, you know, all of a sudden my client who came in with, you know, some mild anxiety is now suicidal and I don't know what to do. So, What are some of the questions that you recommend asking from the beginning? You know, so it's interesting because one of the things that's in my intake assessment that's in, you know, my course is I go through, you really have to start at the very beginning, like when, you know, when you were born and the mother's pregnancy and some people know about their mother's pregnancy and some people don't, but then that starts to lead into, you know, as you go through the years, whatever other traumas they've experienced. And then the other thing that's so key is to ask if they've had anyone in their family, any friends in their community die by suicide, because that puts them at higher risk. So the one thing that I want to kind of go back and say is I use the term died by suicide. A lot of people still use committed suicide. And that's one of the things that we've really been trying to change. And there are a couple good articles on that. One was written by Jonathan Singer, who is now the president of American Association of Suicidology, and John Ackerman, who is in Columbus, Ohio. He should Nationwide Children's Hospital has a suicide prevention center, and he's the clinical psychologist who runs it. And it's a great article. I think it's called Words Matter, but I will give you the link so you can put it in the group. And it really talks about what, you know, if you're talking about committing something, it sounds like you committed a crime and then people, they already have shame about it. So that just increases that even more. So that's one of the things that is important in looking, you know, at that. The other thing is Julie Serrell, who used to be the president of American Association of Suicidology, did a study called hashtag not six. The reason it was called that is because in the past, most people thought that when someone died by suicide, six people were affected by that, who had, you know, contact Mm. with them. What she says is that that was just arbitrarily 
come up with by Ed Schneidman, who's like the father of suicidology. And that's not the case. So she did a study out of the University of Kentucky, and it turns out that upwards of 135 people are affected by one person's suicide. And 25 of those 135 people are severely affected that they need to get mental health treatment or they have, you know, like much more severe of a reaction. So it really does become so much more widespread. And for some of this information, you can check out our show notes. We'll post those on mtsgpodcast.com. So that way, if you're looking for some of this source material yourself, those resources will be accessible there. I'm already getting the sense of not knowing a lot of what you're referring to. And one of the questions that we ask a lot of our guests on this show is, what are therapists missing and what's the right way to do things? And so I'm, I'm really curious about, you know, you're talking about going back to people's birth as part of an intake, but there just seems to be so much about what we don't know in general training from therapists. So yeah. what else are we missing here and what can we do better? There's a guy, um, his name is Dr. Thomas Joyner. He's out of Florida State University. He came up with the interpersonal theory of suicidology or of suicide. And he has three things that really kind of have this perfect storm. And then when someone has this, that's what they look at as a high risk for suicide. So one is like a lack of belongingness. So when people start talking about they don't belong anywhere, so that's like a key thing to look out for. Are they isolated? Are they lonely? Have they been bullied? Do they not have friends? Do they have social anxiety? All of those things is that like lack of belongingness. They have nowhere to attach to. One is burdensome, the feeling of being a burden to others. And I hear that. I can't tell you how many times from especially my teen clients, but also from other people too, when they start struggling, they feel like they're such a burden on other people. And so they don't want to say anything. So that's kind of like those two things. And then the last is the capability is like, do you have access? And like, how are you, you know, are you not afraid to die? Because sometimes people get into that headspace where they just, I call it like they have tunnel vision. It's like if you took a paper towel roll and you just kind of like look down it, then that's all they see. They don't see anything else. A lot of people say, oh, it's so selfish. Suicide's so selfish. They just don't see it. They think that they're being less of a burden to others. So those are some key things to look out for. The other thing is, you know, to ask, like, have they ever had a previous suicide attempt? Because you would be surprised how many people don't ask that. And what happens is, is my clients will tell me, oh my gosh, I've been to so many therapists and no one's ever asked me that. And the ones that have asked seem like they're so nervous about asking that the, my clients don't want to say anything. So they'll just say no. So part of this is really learning to be comfortable with asking these questions about, you know, how did you attempt and what happened after? And, you know, how many times a day do you have thoughts of suicide? One of the things for assessing, I also, and this is also on my website as a download, is uh, the safety plan. But then there's like a five point scale of one to five. So one is that you have never had any thoughts of suicide. You don't have any right now. And five is that you have thoughts, you have a plan, you are going to follow through with killing yourself today. And like, I'm that blunt about it when I say it to my clients. And mm -hmm. then I'll say, what does two, three, and four mean to you? And mm -hmm. so we map out what that means. And I actually have them write it like on a timeline kind of. And then, so a lot of times they'll come in and I'll just be able to ask them, so where are you at on your scale? And I usually ask every single session if I have a depressed client, you know, or a really anxious client who I know that, you know, might be at risk for suicide. With each of the points that you're talking about, I want to dig into them a little bit. So the first thing is, is about this assessment. And you talked about belonging, burden, and capability. Mm -hmm. And so to me, when I think about the training that I initially got around this, it was really ab about that third point about capability, it means and intent, right? Are they capable of doing it? Do they have the motivation to do it? And do they have the means to do it? And I think when we add the other pieces of belonging and 
burden, I think it it paints a bigger picture and it, it also gives us a sense of folks who are not going to necessarily talk about the capability aspects of it because they don't, they know they shouldn't if they want to actually be able to move forward with dying by suicide. So to me, the capability part, I think is where, you know, kind of old school safety contracts came in. It's the part where, you know, people who are savvy will not say, I'm thinking about it and yeah. I have the means to do it because so many therapists stick to just that point. With the belonging and burden aspects of it, it paints such a picture to me. And so when we look at the sense of belonging, I guess this is digging into it just a tiny bit more, but is it is it their felt sense of belonging or their actual community around them or both? Question. It, it could be either or it could be both. You know, it could be one or the other or both because it's really internally to them how they perceive it, you know, and perception. I always say reality is the editor of perception. You know, it's like what your reality is, is not going to be my reality. So the way they think about it is what's important, you know, and it, the other thing with that, it's like, I always used to say to my staff was if it's a crisis to them, then it's a crisis to them. And it's a crisis to us. We don't have to yeah. act in crisis, but it, it has to be treated, you know, seriously. And I, I think that that's key with both things. You know, Katie's talking about this richness of color or adding to the picture. And I'm looking at a, a number of the qualitative aspects of these questions that really goes beyond what's out there as far as you know, some of the, the assessments that seem to have come and gone in the field or, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately are still being taught. I know of some programs that sad persons is still kind of the first line of suicide, the little yeah. assessments that's being done. And, wow. Yeah. No. But, you know, I think for a lot of savvy people that are using something like the Columbia suicide severity scales that I think is a lot more robust, but what I'm hearing from you too is we need to ask earlier rather than when a client's finally brave enough to bring, bring this up of really being able to establish that, hey, I'm willing to talk about suicidal thoughts, even if it's something that's never been here before. But is is there too early to ask about this in any cases? Yeah, no. That I ask about it always, and it's part of my intake assessment. And I ask detailed questions about it, like, have they ever, and do they have any family members, and have they just even have, like, fleeting thoughts about it, and and I really try to normalize it for them to let them know that a lot of people sometimes have these thoughts. It doesn't mean that they're going to do anything and they're afraid to share them, but I don't want them to be afraid in here. Like this is a safe place that we can help them and give them some skills and some tools. And, you know, if it does escalate to be able to come in here and say, this is really worrying me because that is, and, and even with the Columbia Yes, it's evidence-based, but that's why, like, for me, it's important that I have, it's a narrative assessment and conversation with them at all times, you know, with all of these other scales, it's either yes or no, or, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and if it's not one and two, then don't go on. Well, maybe it's not one and two, but maybe they still have, like, other thoughts that aren't, like, in that catch hole, you know? So... I really don't use that per se. <laughs> I really just use a really detailed assessment that, and so that's kind of, you know, everything that I talk about. I teach people in my course, like how to do that and how to feel comfortable doing that and why it's so important to be able to ask those questions. So the question I have is, and it kind of ties to Kurt's question, when a client is coming in with anxiety or work stress or those types of things. It sounds like no matter what they're coming in with, you do a rich suicide assessment. I do. And I hadn't really, I mean, I have it on my intake paperwork, but I hadn't really had it as a piece of my assessment from the beginning if it wasn't a presenting issue. But you're saying every client have this rich assessment. Yeah. So I'll give you a great example is I have an associate 
And when she was an intern for MSW, she worked for me on the crisis team. That was her field placement. So she's pretty savvy in this. We had a kid come in that the mom reported this kid was coming in because she was bit by a dog and she wanted to come in for EMDR because both of us do that. And that was it. That was her only problem. So my associate, just as, you know, I trained her, goes through and starts asking questions and then gets to the, the suicide assessment and asks her, you know, about has she ever had any suicidal thoughts? And so she said, yes. And my associate said, you know, when was the last time you had this? And she goes, today. So, <laughs> and this went back like for a year and it was worse at one point and then it kind of got a little better. She was with another therapist at the time and her mom had no idea. And she was really afraid of the mom. So we, I, I mean, thankfully I didn't have a client. I was able to work with the mom to kind of talk to her first about it. And then we did a safety plan with, you know, the kid, my associate did a safety plan at the time with the kid to kind of come up with skills that she can use. And so the difference between like a safety plan and a contract is a contract it's not valid because they're signing something and saying, I will commit to this, but right. That's not necessarily yeah. what they're going to yeah. do. So the safety plan is just really kind of helping them come up with tools and options in the moment that they can have written down and look at it. And what I usually do within the last year or so I started doing is having them take a screenshot of it. And on their phone, I have them in their photos, make a folder and whatever tools I give them or, you know, any quotes we kind of, you know, come across that they like, we always screenshot it and it goes right into that folder. So they're not having to go through all of their pictures to look for it. It's in one specific place. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. But like that's, that was a perfect example with that teenager that we had no idea that she was coming in with this, that she's coming in for a dog bite. And this has been going on for like a while with her. I think that's just like the perfect example of why you yeah. asked that the very first time, because you just never know. And and I could imagine that, you know, if you have it in some paperwork, people can either dismiss it or just say no. And so if you actually ask the question person to person, you can actually get to it. Yeah. That makes and sense. I, well, so, I mean, that's a good point. So I use simple practice and in simple practice, I have it on the intake paperwork that I send to yeah, them. Yeah, so do I. A lot of times I have clients that say no. And so I will always still ask again and I'll say, hey, so I noticed that you put down no for this, but I'm still going to ask you anyhow. And so I'll go, oh yeah, I've had it, but I just didn't want it anywhere written that I've been suicidal or that I made an attempt. Yeah. Good point. I'm like, okay. So, and then we can explore it that way. Who's really most at risk for having suicidal thoughts there does seem to be kind of you know some of the traditional ones just the general education that we get that adolescents seem to have run a higher risk uh, people from the transgender communities seem to run a higher risk where else are we getting this and if the answer is everybody then please be that direct about it because i, I think in some of the ways that were originally taught about suicidology is just that yeah, there's kind of these groups and you you might ask just kind of that generic question of like, have you ever had these thoughts? But really, are we, you know, just looking at one or two isolated groups? Or are we looking at a lot larger portion of the population? Yeah, I think it's a larger portion of the population, really. You know, in the last couple of years, uh, the CDC comes out with their report every two years. So the last report that came out was 2017, and then we just got it last year. And what it showed was, is that it went from the second, you know, highest cause of death for adolescents, right? Ages 15 to 24 was, that was the second highest. Well, now it's ages 10 to 34. So it's really gone beyond adolescence into that, you know, still young adulthood kind of population and then into the beginning of adulthood. And, you know, then if you look at it, white middle-aged men, extremely high at risk. People over the age of 85, high at risk. People of color, high at risk. It, so many more, there's so much more research that's being done. And that's why a lot of these numbers are, you know, being able to be accessed. Whereas before, there just wasn't as much information. So yeah, it's, you just never know. And it really suggests that the, there's quite a need for really strong assessment 
And so I've, I've heard that message, Noreen. Yeah. <laughs> I will ask everyone. I think about the folks who in the beginning say, no, I've not had suicidal ideation. I'm, you know, I'm fine. And, and, you know, obviously there's, I think there's touch points where we need to come back and check in if we're seeing some of these lack of belonging, feeling like a burden or feeling like they're capable of, mm -hmm. of doing it. But is there a frequency or, or is there a touch point that you would do? Because you said you would do it every session for clients who are depressed. I just get worried because I, I, I also worked in community mental health and I was LPS designated. So I was doing these assessments. And there was oftentimes when folks who were asked every single session or who had these conversations frequently, it they became desensitized to them. They became irritated by them. And so I guess the, the question I have is, is what is the best practice or what would you recommend around how frequently to bring suicidality up with a client who's not currently at risk or voicing risk? Once you've assessed and you kind of agree with that, that, that's, that they're not currently at risk, they're not right. voicing suicidality, what would, your, what would you recommend for folks in that regard? I think it's then you're really needing to watch for, you know, the risk signs and the warning signs um, if they do come up. Because there are people who come into therapy who just have like a mild dysthymic depression or low level anxiety that suicide's just not going to be an issue for them. Yeah. But if you have those folks and then all of a sudden you see that their, you know, symptoms start to escalate or what they're bringing in becomes a little darker then that's probably a good time to ask them. You know, I don't think there's any specific rule or anything like that. Like ask once every five sessions, but there might be <laughs> someone you, you just don't need to ask, you know? But I also think that as people come in and they start to get more comfortable, then they will feel more comfortable talking about it if they know you're comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. There also seems to be a qualitatively different type of... of suicidal thoughts or, or suicidal behaviors. And this is coming really just from my own experience and nowhere near based out of anything. So I'm basically leading to a, I hope there's research backing up what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> but it, throughout the years of my practice, there seems to be kind of the, the very classical, like, I'm super depressed I'm, I have this plan. I have these means. I, I don't want to sort of thoughts. There's the people who are chronically, I want to die. I want to disappear, but I'm never going to actually do it. There's the super impulsive, like I'm not suicidal in this moment, but I have a lot of garbage going on in the background, but who knows this afternoon might just be sort of a, an opportunity. How do we go about treating these different types, there doesn't seem to be a one size fits all treatment to working with suicidal clients. Yeah, there really isn't. And I think you bring up, you know, a lot of good points. One of the things I think, oh, the chronically suicidal, I had a client like that for two years, and she would come in and every week, you know, I'd say, so where are you on your scale? She was always a two, like she always had these suicidal thoughts. And that she just wanted, you know, her pain to end, but she didn't want to do anything to die. And so we just kind of monitored it. And we just continued to talk about, you know, how we can make things, you know, better at this point in her life. Like what is going to, you know, make her function at a higher level and keep her functioning. And the big thing is, is like, what do they have hope for? You know, do they, I always ask that, you know, is like, what is it that you hope for the future? Can you name one or two things? And if they cannot, then that's when you need to be concerned because there's no forward thinking about anything in their life. But, you know, generally people will give you something and then that's, you continue to work with that. So that's like the chronically, the classically suicidal is, I, I kind of think we've been talking about it, you know, is work with them on skills. DBT is highly successful. And Marsha Linehan, that's how it was developed was out of her own suicidal, you know, thoughts that I always go back to emotional regulation, you know, and, um, and all that kind of stuff. And then the last one was the impulsive and the impulsive, you can just continue to reinforce with them, you know, 
call me. If you can't reach me, call the crisis team, like continually give them actions, really work with them on some mindfulness skills, because that's what happens when they become impulsive is they're not thinking in the moment. They're thinking like two minutes ahead, five minutes ahead, et cetera. So I think for me, the the thing that I hear that, that I think is really critical to, to track here is that you do a great assessment and make sure that you're actually showing that you're comfortable talking about it. And I think that's the thing that's going to be hard. Like clinicians have to desensitize themselves to the anxiety around this is the biggest risk that we have is if one of our clients dies by suicide, there's a liability to us. Obviously we care about this person in front of us and we don't want them to do that, but I I think, and we don't want them to die, but I think there's that piece of this is the part that feels super scary. I mean, maybe child abuse and, and those types of things, you know, kind of other domestic violence, those things can feel really scary as well. But but when we have someone in front of us that is looking at suicide as an option, I think it's something where that feels so uncomfortable. And I, I think that when people assess it, they can get really awkward and clumsy. And so you're really saying, like, get to a place where the assessment is comprehensive. You've created a space that there's comfort in talking about it and then continue to look for the risk factors. And when that comes up, really find a a way to make plans for skills, strategies, connections, you know, improving quality of life so that there's a, a way to sustain. And I think the piece that really stuck with me in the training that I've gotten about this topic is really asking what's keeping you from killing yourself right now? You know, what is, what is keeping you alive? And, and really looking at kind of what can you look forward to? I think when you talk about gratitude, that's, that's really important. But I think being able to actually address it head on is so much more powerful because it, it makes it not scary. And it makes it very practical. I'm I'm like, I liked having the practical conversations. But I think the other thing, and this is the thing that I think you've been kind of talking about, but I'm going to say directly, is that Asking our clients about suicide is not going to give them the idea to do so. 100%. It is going to open the conversation. And so I, I would really encourage clinicians who have been contacting Noreen, fearful to talk to their clients about suicide. You are doing a greater service to your clients by actually bringing it up and making it an okay topic to talk about versus skirting around it. Because then your clients feel like they have to take care of you and they are a burden to you because they have these suicidal thoughts. Yeah. So I think you don't want to add to the problem is I guess what I'm saying. No, no. And, and you're spot on because that's one of the things I talk about is that you are not going to put these thoughts in their head. And I just did a talk at one of the high schools with another clinician I used to work with and it was you know, for the high schools, we had to term it anxiety and depression. But of course, then I talked about suicide. (laughs) Of course, of course. (laughs) And I did say that to them. I said, you know, I know that you are all afraid that you're going to put this in your kid's head, but it's already there if it's there, you know, and if it's not, they're going to go, what are you talking about? This is, you know, so yes, the more comfortable you are and the more direct you are, the better. This might be somewhat, you know, for those of us who work mostly with adolescents and over the last several years, there's been kind of this preponderance of suicide memes and really coming out of the internet culture where there's a blurring of the lines between humor and depression and truly suicidal thoughts. And I know that you still work with a lot of adolescents and if this is something that's coming up in your practice too, but I've found this to be a, really natural way of taking what's happening in internet culture and being able to talk about, you know, what it really is happening on a personal level and being able to even use that as a pathway into talking about some of the more difficult things with clients. And fortunately for my practice at this time that the kids who find these things humorous are not reporting suicidal thoughts, but that it is something that is out there and is more of an opportunity for clinicians to talk about as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think with teens, anytime you can find any gateway in to be able to talk about it, use it. And that's something that, you know, sometimes I'll say, oh, did you see, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then that will lead into being able to, and they're like you said, they'll go, oh yeah, that was so funny. I'm like, well, you know, can we talk about this for a second? And unfortunately, there's been a lot of suicides in the high schools within 
Ventura County and even like Agora, like this whole area within the last few years. So it's really been a topic of importance in our area and talking with kids. And so a lot of these kids I do work with have been affected by that. I think this is a topic that is one that we could talk about for hours. And obviously, you've got a whole course, so we'll we'll get to that. This has been, I think, a, a good starting point to, to really kind of reassess how are we managing suicide with clients. We're going to have another episode with you very soon where we can talk about therapists as the, the folks who are dying by suicide or having suicidality. But for folks who are listening to this episode, where can they find you and, and where can they find your course? They can find me at noreenvanderhoeven.com. No www, just the H. Because <laughs> otherwise you'll wind up in an old website. Um, and my course is listed on my website under resources. And also, if you go to that tab under resources, it'll say suicide prevention or safety planning. And I have several downloads that you can download from there that you will find helpful to be able to use in your practice. Thank you so much. That's, that's very generous. And we will include the link to all of those resources in our show notes. And you can find those show notes at our website, mtsgpodcast.com. And while you're over there, check out all of the wonderful things that we have going on and coming up, including the Therapy Reimagined 2020 conference here in the Los Angeles neighborhood of Universal City. Once again, we are super excited to be tackling all of the things currently going on in the therapy world and with therapists and super excited to be rolling out our full conference speakers here in the next couple of months here. So once again, mtsgpodcast.com. Thank you for listening. I'm Kurt Whithelm with Katie Vernoy and Noreen Vanderhoeven. Thanks again to our sponsor, Lisa Marie Accounting. It's time to be empowered by your biz money. When the birth control pill came on the scene, women were empowered sexually. No longer did they have to depend on a man for protection or preparation or provision. Financial Freedom Monthly does the same for women entrepreneurs regarding their finances. With a constant but sassy eye on budgeting, growth, income, and outgo, plus a heavy dose of mindset upleveling around finances, abundance, pricing, and growth, our members are financially empowered. They know where their business money is going, they have a plan, and the profit to grow. They're overly dependent on no one, including that needy client, for their income and stand tall on their own two financial feet. When the tax man comes around, they're prepared for taxes and may be irritated, but they're not shocked, panicked, and scrambling for how to pay Uncle Sam. And woman, this empowerment is sassy and sexy. Freedom Financial Monthly is an online membership for women entrepreneurs who are ready to grow not only their business, but their income, their sense of peace around finances, and confidence around cash. Just for Therapy Reimagined listeners, register today using code Therapy Reimagined and get your membership at founding member pricing. For all the sassy details, visit Lisa at lisamariaaccounting.com forward slash financial hyphen freedom hyphen monthly. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 